Awesome. Well, praise God. All right. He's risen, huh? It's good news. Really great news. So how many of you remember years ago when Facebook introduced something called the it's complicated status? <laughs> I thought that was the weirdest thing. Uh, for me personally, I thought that was pretty weird, right? It was, there was status, I'm single. I kind of understand what that means. I am married. I understand exactly what that means. Divorce, don't have a clue, but I've seen divorce papers. I know what that means. Uh, it, it, then there was even one called in civil union. Don't agree with it, but I understand exactly what it means. But then there was this thing called it's complicated. Because it's kind of in between this, kind of this, your relationship is here, it could be there, it may be somewhere else. And oftentimes we make the gospel complicated. We make it unnecessarily complicated. The Bible says in first, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 11, it's, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church and he begins to describe some, he says, I'm, I'm afraid for you that you're going to be tricked and deceived and move away from the simplicity that is in Christ. He started to get nervous. He said, just like Eve got tricked and moved away from the simplicity of the gospel. He says, you might be tricked to move with simplicity of the gospel. And today, and as I remember three years ago, one of the things that we said in that very first Encounters Church service, the gospel is very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. He didn't make it complicated. You don't need to make it complicated. I want you to realize that God loves you and he's not interested in making your life complicated. He's interested in keeping things simple. And I want you to experience the simplicity of the gospel. Paul wrote it this way. He says, for I'm jealous for a godly jealousy and I betroth you, but I'm afraid that the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery and that your minds be led astray from the simplicity of the gospel. Let's kind of think about what happened with Eve and, and Adam in the garden. Eve and Adam, great place. They're running around in total harmony. It's a wonderful thing, Adam and Eve. If you remember Genesis chapter 1 and verse 25, the Bible says, and God made everything and God said it was good. And then God made man and woman and then he said that it was very good. So only the only thing that they had in front of their eyes was good and very good. And then what happened? This is how complications happen. The serpent came, comes into the garden and the serpent says, Hey guys, do you know that if you eat of that tree, you will be like God? You want to know what makes that so complicated? Whose image were they already made in? They were already made in the image and likeness of God. So the serpent comes in and says, Let's make this complicated. He thinks he's going to make it simple. He says, why don't you eat the fruit so you can look like, be like God. The enemy will always try to trick you to get something you already have through works that God already naturally gave to you. Now, now th think about it. What, what was the reason the serpent got kicked out of hell? He thought that he said, you know what? I'm going to try to be like God. That was his thing. And then he used the say, how did that work out for the devil? Not too good, right? He ended up getting kicked out. How did that work out for Adam and Eve? Not too good either. Because the Bible says that they went and they ate of the knowledge of good and evil. I, this may sound slightly controversial, but I feel that there is something about the purity and devotion to Christ that God wants our eyes to see good. He wants us to look for good. 
He wants us to look for good in the world, look for good around you, look for good everywhere you could see, because that began the trickle effect of the problems. Their eyes were open, the Bible says, and they were able to know the eight of the knowledge of good and evil. All the time, they saw the, the trees. They were in perfect bliss, perfect harmony. They were wonderful, enjoying the presence of the Lord. Everything was great. And when they ate of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, the introduction of the knowledge of evil comes in. And with the introduction of the knowledge of evil, everything starts going, wow, that looks different. That's not the same. I don't know how that looks. And I, I want to encourage you, in the garden, before all the problems in this world happened, what was their, their position? They were looking for good. And so last year, Pastor's Appreciation Day, it was the funniest thing I thought. Sandra, who is doing our translation for us, right? So if you're hearing someone mumbling in the background, it's our translator. Thank, thank you, Sandra, for doing the translator. I'm trying to talk as slow as I possibly can. She says, I talk too fast. And she gets, I'm time to translate it. Okay. So she's, she's trying. She said, she says, I want to thank God for Pastor Andre and Pastor Caleb because they are gold diggers. I'm like, that's the craziest compliment I've ever heard in my life. But I certainly got what she was saying. Because my wife and I, we've made it a point that if we see a field of dirt, we're going to look for gold. If I see your life looks messy, I'm going to try to find the gold in there. If I've got to say it's a sunny day outside, that's how I'm going to start my conversation. I want to make sure and find the gold that's inside of you. The Bible puts it this way in Ephesians 2, 2 and, 12, uh, and 10. It says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That word workmanship comes from the Greek word poema, where we get the word poem. And it is a great, and a poem is a uh, artistic creation. So in other words, God is saying that we are his great artistic creation. Do you know what happens when you look at artistic creation? It says, that artistic creation looks terrible. You're not really saying it about the artistic creation. You're really speaking about the artist. So if I see mess in your life, if I see dirt in your life, my first goal is to find out where's the goal. I've got to find the goal. You know, you know sometimes you've got to dig real hard to find some of that goal. <laughs> but it's okay. I could find gold inside of you. And that's what I think the original intent of God was. He looked across and he says, look, it was good. His, his role to add, Adam's only job was to steward what God put in front of you. God wants you to steward the good that's in front of you. He wants you to steward what he's placed in your hands. And, and so on, on this, this resurrection day, I'm reminded, let us keep it simple. Keep your relationship with God simple. Don't make it complicated with all the things that you can make your relationship with God complicated. Let's go through about a, a couple items and then we'll see what God does. Here's something about the cross. So when we think about the cross of Jesus Christ, I'm going to walk through a couple items with you. The cross of Jesus Christ was more relational than it was transactional. The cross of Christ was more relational than it was transactional. When we think of the cross, when, if you think of it, the Bible says, our Father who art in heaven. God's whole positioning is all relational. That scripture doesn't say, our King who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Is God our King? Absolutely 100%. He starts off with the position of Father. God is relational. And God's whole positioning with us is all relational. When we think of the kingdom, we think of family. God's put a kingdom in place that looks a lot like family. And, and so I believe that the intention of God was to make our connection with him relational. What was in the garden? God came down in the cool of the day to what? Have a relational connection with man. When sin came into this world, what that did is that mankind now had this infection in their life and God needed to deal with the issue of sin. And for, thousand, for at least a thousand years, this was exactly how the, the early church writers understood it. They understood that when Christ, they understood when God 
came to the earth. And when Christ came, it was a relational context in which he came to restore us back to. Our relationship with the Father. But somewhere along the line, it was like about a thousand years after, um, a thousand years after Christ died. It was around this guy called Anselm of Canterbury. He had this other thought that yes, it's supposed to be relational, but when Christ died for you, Anselm did something that made it a little complicated. What he did was he said, Christ didn't just die for you to bring you back to the Father. But what Christ was doing, he was paying off the debt of an angry God towards you. And that changed the dynamic from the year, he, he, Anselm was born in 1033, um, right in the year after Christ. And he, he was a smart guy and he, he theorized that it, th that that was supposed to be the method that God was angry with mankind. And, and that's, that's what he did. I'm here to say, my friends, God is not angry with you. God's not angry with anybody. The reason why Christ died wasn't because that God was like, you know what? I'm tired of these people. I'm going to kill them. And then Jesus said, oh, please don't kill these people. I'm going to stand in their stead. I want to be killed instead. All right, because we, you know that after I, after you die, the Christian virtue is going to be if anything, if somebody wrongs someone, death has to be the penalty. So yes, you go die. And then Jesus says, I'll be the whipping boy for everyone and I'll take the whips for everything. Wasn't like that. God did not have a wrath to satisfy in the sense, in, in the sense of you were the, the direction of his wrath. If we have to say that God had a wrath to satisfy, it was the thing that was killing us, which was our sin. God, if do you believe in the wrath of God? I sure do. It's against sin. It's not against me. God has no wrath against me. John chapter five and ver John, John chapter five says, "The Father judges no one, but He's commended all judgment to the Son." What happened at the cross? He, Jesus took the sin and the weight of the world upon Him, and the, the wrath of God says, "That's the thing I want to get rid of." God is not angry with you. That's important to understand because if you think God is angry with you, you operate accordingly. Everyone who is married in this room, if you think your wife is angry with you, your life changes and things become different. Oh, no, I got no amens because everyone. But Jose and Marisol did such a great job. Nobody's wife is angry with them. That is great job you guys did. Took away all the wrath. If someone you're in relationship with is angry with you, it changes the way the relationship works. Because when there is anger, it changes how things work. If you believe that God is angry with you, you will operate from a posture of being an orphan. I'm here to say it categorically, 100%, that God is not angry with you in any form or fashion. So he's expecting, so his, his, his thing is relational. The cross came to redeem us from death and connect us in union and fellowship with God. The cross did not come to pay off a debt and settle a transaction from heaven. In that time, in, in the year 10, and I know I'm getting into like a little bit of history. I'm glad you had some coffee and some donuts to keep you going for a little bit longer. But <laughs> But when, when Anselm, when he, Anselm was Canterbury, he had the state, what that was called, uh, theologically was called the satisfaction theory, that God had a debt to satisfy and Jesus had to satisfy the debt. That made it complicated. And then as things went on, they said, well, you know, it's not just a debt to satisfy, but God had to be a substitute for it. So then it became the substitutionary theory. And then it was, you know, there's a penalty to satisfy as well. And then it became the penal substitution theory. And then all these theories, and everybody's got a scripture that makes it sound right. And I'm like, you know what? Which one points me to Jesus? I don't care. Just give me a theory that points me to Jesus. And the whole point is, is that as time progressed, and the, the reason why the substitutionary, I'm sorry, the satis, yeah, uh, which, what was that one? The satisfaction theory was, was popular 
was actually in the medieval times. And I don't know if you remember in the medieval, if you saw Braveheart, you kind of get a gr glimpse for the medieval times. And in that day, honor was a big thing. And the lords and the honor was important. And if you remember from Braveheart, um, when they were going to do that fight, the um, but Sir William Wallace said, I fight and you may die, run and you may live, at least for a while, and then dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade these days, just these days, one chance, just one chance to come back and tell our enemies that it may take our lives, but it can't take our freedoms. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? <laughs> because if, as I say those words, you guys, you get that whole sense of chivalry and honor and this ha if something happens someone has to pay a debt someone has to pay. that was what was happening in that time so it was easy for the people of that time to grasp the idea of yeah god had a debt to satisfy because william wallace was right there satisfying debt he was slashing heads but all that did it made it complicated the word salvation in the koine greek actually means to that word sozo has the roots to mean rescue from all god is did, all god did when he came when christ came freely and willingly gave up his life he rescued you from your sin he pulled you out of a miry clay he set your feet on a rock to stay that is the purpose of the cross the cross is relational it's not transactional and oftentimes we tend to make a transaction. Okay, you know what? I, I, I said my prayers today, so I'm good with God. I, I, I read my Bible today. I'm good with God. I, I fasted three days in one day. And I'm good with God. I don't know how you do that. But it's always a thing to make you good. God, I'm going to trade my works with you to make sure that I'm in good standing with you. It's all about relationship. If I had to say, well, it, it kind of, I have to do the dishes. I no, kid. <laughs> if my wife says, hey, you don't get any more food in this house unless you do those dishes, that becomes transactional, right? Wait a second, did that happen yesterday? No, that did not happen yesterday. <laughs> but you understand, if you're in a relationship with someone and your relationship is transactional, it does not feel like a relationship. If your relationship with someone is in a quid pro quo format, that's not the intention of God. He doesn't want it to be like he wants to look more relational than it should be transactional. Here's this other thing that the cross did for us. Oh, I forgot this nice scripture I was going to tell you about the cross. So relational, not transactional. First Peter chapter three and verse 18, it says, for Christ also suffered for our sins once for all time, the, the, the just for the unjust, so he might bring us to God. Not so he could settle a debt, not so he could pay a penalty, so he might bring us to God, being having been put to death in the flesh, being made alive in the spirit. Amen. Amen. Here's the other thing. What the cross of Christ looked like, it looked more medical rather than legal. It looked more medical rather than legal. Here's what I, here's what I mean by that. We, we grasp, and, and I'm not saying, the reason I put rather and not is because I think the medical example has a greater truth than the legal example because we understand that when Christ died for our sins, he paid a, a ransom for it. It wasn't to satisfy, it was to deal with the issue of sin. And we could understand that from a legal standpoint, that if Jose gets a speeding ticket and I say, Jose, I'd like to pay for your speeding ticket. There's, I could say, okay, I could go ahead, go down to the courthouse and pay the money. And I have satisfied the debt that Jose has to the, um, the city for his speeding ticket. When we think of it in a medical context, it looks a little different. Because if somebody has cancer, I can't say, I'll go ahead and take your chemotherapy in your key, in your stead. It doesn't work like that, right? There's no way it works like that. It, what, because what has to happen is there must be a cure applied to them. There must be a cure. And so 
th that cure was the blood of Jesus that came. And when the cross came, when Jesus died for our sins, he executed a cure for sin in our lives. Sin was killing us. The wages of sin brings death. But as God's gift comes, it gives us eternal life. So God's gift, his salvation, feels more like a medical transaction more than a legal transaction because oftentimes we view the cross as legal. Nothing wrong with that. I don't think that's a bad analogy, but I feel there's a greater reality to look at it from a legal standpoint. Here's why. Here's one way I'm going to kind of explain that out for you. This text in um, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for us only, but also for those of the whole world, right? In there, I've record, there's a word called propitiation. Let's read that sort. Let's read that, read that again. It says, himself is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, also for those of the whole world. Um, you're probably looking at that word. If you're new to church, you're saying, what's that thing called propitiation? It's kind of big. <laughs> and the one person who's brave enough to say, yeah, I was kind of thinking that. What's propitiation, right? So interesting enough, that word propitiation, actually, and, and me and Kayla had a little Greek thing yesterday, and I felt kind of happy that I kind of showed us something to Greek yesterday. You know, She might be thinking, you didn't show me anything. <laughs> So that word propitiation actually is where we get the word mercy from. It's actually recorded a couple of times in the text. And um, one of the times it's mentioned is with the word mercy seat. And if you remember what a mercy seat was, a mercy seat, when the Ark of the Covenant was there, there was a plate of gold, like two and a half cubits by two and a half cubits. There were two angels, cherubims, pointing this way. And the Bible says that God will come down between the mercy seat and he would speak to the high priest, right? So the mercy seat's a place where God speaks, a quick side lesson. Another time where that word mercy is mentioned in the text is when the publicans um, cried, cried out, not, not the republicans, the publicans, right? That's what the Bible calls it, right? The publicans, okay? The Bible says that, that they cried out to God and says, God, she said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That same word mercy is used. And so when we think about what how mercy works, mercy is not really a hey. You have a debt to pay, you got to pay your debt. Because think of it, when things go, if, if you do something wrong, the police come, they lock you up. You don't just say, hey, my, I, 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 I'm sorry for what I did, let me off. You don't just say sorry and then naturally pay a penalty, right? Go to jail or, or whatever the, the penalty is. But that word mercy seat, right, has the, the symbolism and the reference to God. The sin that we had, he is saying, I will have mercy on you and I will get that off of your deck. He is curing the sin issue. He is not satisfying a, a, an angry God. The cross, when it came, it came to solve a sickness that was inside of us. It came to solve something that was there that needed that needed to be taken care of. So, so when we when we think of the cross, think of it more that Christ came and his blood came to take care of us medically more than it is a legal requirement that has to be paid. Amen. All right, let, let's roll on to another one. So here's something else that the cross did. The cross... removed our consciousness of sin that's very important it's very important let's let's read the text uh in hebrews chapter 10 some of the writers of of hebrews wrote it a little differently some have at the you see where uh where's that second to last line where it says have no longer consciousness of sin some writers made that a period 
Um, but if you read the entire three verses, you get more context to understand what is saying. So here's what the Hebrew writer is saying. For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the form of those things in itself, can never by the same sacrifice which they offered continually every year make those approach perfect. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to offer because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would have no longer have consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there remain there is a reminder of their sins every year. The background of the book of Hebrews, the, these were people that just came out of 1,300 years of history, and all they knew in order for them to be purified of sin, they had to make a sacrifice. They had to go kill a lamb, a bullock, make that sacrifice, and once they made that sacrifice, and there would be a symbolic action where the priest would take their ha his hands and he would take their sin put it on the animal and send that animal off and that animal would have symbolically collected all their sins and took their sins away. And at that moment in time, they were clean. And as soon as they walked out and they thought, oops, I just thought of sin again. I have to wait a whole year now to do this ceremony again. That, that's how it worked. That's how it, that's how it worked. And so what there was, there was always a, hey, and next year, you know, I'm, I've got a bunch of sins. Let me gather this thing up because I've got to make sure and make my sacrifice for sin at the top of every year, whenever that, that season comes. And I think even in modern day, um, Judaism right now, they still do what's, what's the name of the, the sacrifice for sin, um, ceremony again called? What one of them? Is it Yom Kippur? I, I don't know what it's called. One, one of them. It's a sacrifice for sin. Yom Kippur, is it? Sacrifice for sin. Yom Kippur. All right. Thank you, Jewish David, for giving me that information. <laughs> Kayla had to help you. The Greeks had to help the Jews on that one. All right. All right. <laughs> so, the, so, so a, a sacrifice has to be made for sin. But if you think about it, the, the Bible says in the book of Romans that the strength of the law, sin is the strength of the law. Meaning that when you, you cannot deal with sin consistently, let, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that again. The strength of the law is in sin. It, if your, your, your mind, the way God made your mind is with a capacity to think in the positive. I'll give you this example. Everybody in the room, do not at this moment think of a pink elephant. Do not do it. Do not think of a pink elephant. What is the image in your mind right now? Regardless of if I say, that's the point of that text, that sin is the strength of the law. When you put a law down, it gives a reason to say, let me do that law. How many memes have we seen with there, there's somebody put, do not touch this thing. People touch all around it. Like, like how many memes on Facebook have you seen like that? Like when you put a law down, you just said, Hey, I have something to break now. I want to break that law. I, I had a friend years ago. She went on a diet. She never was, never was much of a diet person. On this diet, she's like reading the thing, went to do all the shopping, everything went well. And on the diet, it said, no croutons. She doesn't like croutons. She doesn't care for croutons. Croutons are not one of the things that she does. But she happened to have an old box of stale croutons in her house. And guess what? what she was eating a lot in that diet? Croutons. Why? A law was put down. And because there was a law, it suddenly drove her towards it. When there's a consciousness, you do not solve your sin problem by saying, I've got to keep that sin on the top of my mind. That doesn't help your sin problem. Oh, I don't want to sin today. I don't want to sin today. I don't want to sin today. You know what will probably happen in three seconds after that prayer? You'll probably end up sinning. 
I mean, you, you see this all the time when working with, with, with my son. I never forget my son. We are, he was two and a half years old. We're having dinner with lunch with some friends at a, a taco place down the street there. And we said, a Aaron's running around. He's making these massive circles. Aaron, stop running. And he does this fast walk, very fast walk. He wasn't breaking the law. He wasn't breaking the law. But only because I said a law was because he, he, he realized he needed to do. So re religion, re religion is a tool that always tries to bring up your past. Religion is a tool. All it seeks to do, it seeks to bring up your past. I want to encourage you to see your past only in the light of how God sees it. Because if you see your past outside of how God sees it, you're believing a lie. When you believe a lie, you empower the liar. Think, think of Sarah. How many remember that story with Sarah? Sarah didn't. Sarah, she, she made the biggest mistake that we still watch on TV every night. She decided, God, you, you know what, God? You're not bringing the son of promise fast enough. Got a great idea. Why don't I roll up with Hagar? I, Abraham, Hagar, meet Abraham, meet Hagar, bond servant. Great. Let's make Ishmael. Come a great problem for the world. That was Sarah's idea, right? That was Sarah. Right? It's like, Sarah, come on. You could, why would you do that? I mean, the the, the Bible recalls one of the things that happened with um, Ishmael. It says that you, he shall be like a wild donkey across the earth. When I look in the Middle East, that's exactly what they are. And the, by the way, the Bible didn't use the word donkey. We're in American church. I'm going to use a nice word. Donkey. The Bible says you shall be like a wild donkey or what's the earth? That was Sarah. Made a big blunder. Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says that Sarah heard the word of the Lord and believed it. <gasps> wait, 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 wait. Is that the same Sarah who made that big blunder? But the writer of the book of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says Sarah believed the word of the Lord and, and was counted for righteousness. So when God looks at it in the prism of God's eyes, it looks a whole lot different to the way we look at it. We look at it as a blunder. But God says, I'm looking at it very, very differently. It should be legal as a believer to look at their past outside of the goggles of Jesus. You have to look at it through the eyes of God, through the eyes of Christ. Because if you believe something about yourself that God hasn't said about you, you're believing a lie. Nobody likes lies. Nobody wants to believe lies. And so God, what God has come, because th think of the, these Jewish guys, the, the thing that they knew that they were going to be better was when, when these Jewish guys, they stopped performing sacrifices, 1300 years of history. That's all they did was perform sacrifices. They stopped performing these sacrifices. Wow. These guys are different because now their consciousness wasn't on, Hey, I've got to perform a sacrifice. What's unfortunate is that they perform sacrifices once a year, but oftentimes in the evangelical world, the minute we sin, oops, I just thought of it. Oop, we're performing sacrifices day by day, minute by minute. We're almost performing some sacrifice in our mind. Instead of being focused on your sin, focus on your forgiveness. Focus on what was accomplished 2,000 years ago on the cross. Because when Christ forgave you, he forgave your past sins, your present sins, and the ones that you could ever think about in the future that you never thought of. That's what he did. And I promise you, if you focus on your forgiveness, and that becomes the start point, your Christ focus, you would stop sinning. It would create less sin points in your life because, oh, it's Jesus. Oh, I'm so enthroned in Jesus. 
Oh, Jesus, you're so amazing. The idea is to focus on what Christ has done. Because oftentimes, th this was part of what happened right after Anselm of Canterbury. It became a, let me see what I could do to make this thing better. Let me have, get my works and what I've done and the works that I could do to make my life better. And what Christ is saying is the Christ that dwells in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. As Christ lives inside of you, it changes. He changes you from the inside out. We don't live in a performance management type thing. We don't live from a place of behavior management. Behavior management doesn't work. Well, my wife's a therapist. She would tell you from every day, hey, stop doing that. That simply doesn't work. The right motivation work. My motivation is, God, I see the beauty of who you are. When you beholding the beauty of our Savior, beholding the beauty of the Master, it changes you from the inside out. And so the cross has come to remove our consciousness of sin. That's a far better game. Plan. Listen, if you want to be conscious of your sin, th that's fine. You, you're, you're, if... If that's working out for you, that's great. Asterisk. Am I saying that we don't sin? Of course not. I'm not saying that in any form or fashion. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I'm not saying you don't sin. I'm not saying that sin doesn't happen. But I'm saying that one of the things that Christ did on the cross was he came to remove your consciousness of sin. The less conscious you are of it is probably the less you don't you do it. Let, 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 let's think of the things that you lose consciousness of during the day. Boy, I should probably uh let's say exercise. The more you forget, if you forget more about your exercise program, you become less conscious of it, the consciousness starts growing this way. You get a reminder of your unconsciousness of your exercise program. When you're not conscious of something, that is what you forget about it. You totally forget about what you're not conscious of. You have to be intentional. So why do I want to be intentional and remind myself of my sin? Bad idea. Just a bad idea. So that's what the cross did. The cross was... Relational, not transactional. It's medical rather than being legal. It took away our consciousness of sin. And here's one of the last things it did. Well, one of the many things it did. The cross removed our fear of punishment. Here's this text. First John chapter 4, and verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear of, involves what? Punishment. The one who Fears is not perfected in love. Fear involves punishment. There is uh, many, many within the, the body of Christ are afraid that if they do something wrong, God's about to drop the hammer. As a matter of fact, one of the theories that occurred right after Anselm of Canterbury, they, they were saying um, that God will forgive your sins uh, up till baptism, and then after baptism, you have to do something to do it. And, and what, what, what actually occurred, believe it or not, was that there was this system, and I think it, it kind of started off in the Catholic Church and through the Dark Ages, was a system of, of penance. Right. So when you would um, sin, you would go to a church and you would um, throw out some coins uh, in, into the bucket and then you would get your sins be, be re relieved of you. And I'm telling you, there are some great cathedrals in Scotland, hundreds of years old that were built upon the backs of penance. Right. It, it, interestingly enough. Um, when that the word where the Bible says repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, that word repent actually means change the way you think, right? It's actually a think word. But when the translators in 1611, um, who translated the King James Version, they translate that word repentance, which means change the way you think, which is a thinking word, 
which is a compound word of repentance, paying off. Keep paying off. Keep paying off the angry God. All that was doing, they were making it complicated. Keep it simple. Christ died for your sins. And so with this issue of punishment, I realize that God is, when I read things like this, and I think about the implications of what this means, I get the picture of why he is God and I'm not. I remember the lady caught in adultery. Bible records a story of a lady, the, the chief priests were there, and this lady got caught in adultery. Now, in classical understanding, typically for adultery to take place, there's usually two people. I don't understand when the text says there was a lady caught in adultery. You can't have adultery by yourself, right? The Bible records a lady caught in adultery. Because under Jewish law, there was very little penalty for a man caught in adultery, but it was a much stiffer penalty for a lady caught in adultery. So this lady's caught in adultery, they drag her out, and the, the, the Pharisees and the chief elders, they said, Gee, we got Jesus now. We got him right now. They brought her out, and they put her out there, and they said, Master, Jesus, according to the law, this lady's caught in adultery. She's got a, something coming to her. We've got our little boulders, and we are ready to go. And Jesus saw him. And the lady is there, and they've got their boulders in their hand, and Jesus goes down in the sand, and he starts marking something in the sand breaking up on this and jesus said sinless one kenobi oh no he didn't say that <laughs> sinless one kenobi he who hath no sin you cast the first stone that lady by right needed to be punished when you do something wrong, you've got to be punished. Because that's the Christian virtue. When those people from the other side who didn't vote like me, we have to punish them. Punish. He who has the, no sin cast the first stone. The lady I could picture crunkled up, waiting for the first gash against the head or a side. But she's not hearing stones against her body. She's hearing stones fall to the ground. One, one, one. And she looked up because she knows the law says you've got to be punished. And as she looked up, she saw Jesus. And the real sinless one, Kenobi, says, Where are your accusers? And this would have been the time for Jesus to say, you know what? I need you in 25 discipleship classes. I need you to get your act together because I saved you this time because you're in trouble. I could see the religious crowd say, look at Jesus. He just released a spirit of adultery into the nation. Look at Jesus releasing the spirit of adultery all over this nation. I could see it. I could see the religious crowd right now. Jesus gave her the, the simple thing. Hey, go and sin no more. That's it, Jesus. No punishment. This is pre-cross. No punishment. That was what was in your mind. You've taken away the need for punishment because of the cross? I think so. Think about that story, prodigal son. That story really should be called the rock star father. Because in that time, if you said, hey, dad, I, I want all my money. Basically, what he was saying, an inheritance is something you get when somebody dies. That kid basically said, hey, dad, 
I wish you were dead. But since you're alive, why should you give me all the money that's supposed to give me when you're dead? That's basically what that kid said. Well, if Aaron never showed up on... <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Get back in the spirit. Andre. Well, I could see Thomas saying it. <laughs> that's why you laughed. You're like, I could totally see Thomas like, Dad, hey, listen, give me my coins. He already has said that. Okay, all right. This is not a prophetic word. Well, this is how you deal with this. Let me, let me give you a really good help of how you handle this whole project. He takes his money. He goes. The Bible says he spends it on riotous living. He goes and basically, as we say, he acted the fool. Been crazy, done the craziest thing. In that culture, you go out, you do that, as the Italians say, you're dead to me. Right? It's not all the Italians say, <laughs> you're dead to me. You don't come back in this house. That's what's supposed to happen. The Bible says that the father looked at him from a way off. And the father didn't say, who is that? That's not Noah's kid that took my money. Somebody grab that kid and kill him. Father didn't say that. Father said, hey, look, that's my son. He got up from where he is. It was very undignified for a man to be running in those days, running around. He went and he ran towards his son. He grabbed him, put his arm around him. He put a ring on his finger and he said, this is my son who was gone and he's come back home. The right thing for that father to do was to say, you're dead to me. God has taken away the need for punishment. He's taken it away. I don't really grasp how to live this out. I really struggle with how to make this a reality in my life because I deal with crazy. My wife deals with crazy people every day. We all deal with craziness every day. How do we live this up? I really don't know. But when I look at the text, I realize that there is something about uh, when the father says, I will give grace. When the father says, you who deserve the worst, I will give you grace. When the father says, hey, look at this. Look at all the dirt in the field. Let me find the gold that's there. And the says that. It tells me a picture of what the cross did. It is really simple. The simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of what, what the Father did, the simplicity that the Father is not interested in punishing you, the simplicity that the Father does not have a debt to pay and He's angry with you and He wants to wring your neck. Simplicity of the gospel of our devotion to Christ. This morning, I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes for a minute. And I want to ask if you're hearing these words that I'm saying today and you're feeling like you're under a load of punishment. You feel like God is punishing you for something. You feel like God is angry with you. I want to invite you to meet up. So I'm reintroducing you to a loving God. I'm introducing you to a God who is beautiful. I'm introducing you to a God that has taken away a need for punishment. I'm introducing you to a God who is not angry with you. I'm introducing you to a God that came and dealt with the infection of your sin. I'm introducing you to a God that wants to have relationship and communion with you. You might be thinking God has every right to slay you. But he's taken away that need for punishment. If you're in this room and you've never given your life over to this wonderful God. You've had a picture of God. You've heard of this God before. You've heard of Jesus before. You've, you've heard, you've been in religion for, for many years. And t 
today I presented a picture of Jesus you've never seen before. The one who really is without sin and he didn't even choose to cast a stone. The one who took away our consciousness of sin. The one who is not angry with you. You might be thinking, man, is there consequences for my sin? Of course they are. But it ain't coming from Jesus. It ain't coming from that loving Father. It ain't coming from the one who has all rights because of your sin to start throwing stones. This Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. This Jesus says, go and sin no more. If you want that to be your marching orders, go sin no more. I want to encourage you right now where you are to connect your heart with heaven. I want you to connect your heart with the Lord. If you feel like you want to make a step by coming to the front and I have someone pray with you. Do that. If you feel like you want to just make a commitment to this God, you if you feel like you want to be introduced relationally to this God that I was talking about, if you feel like you want to be introduced relationally and not transactionally to this God that I'm talking about, come meet me up front here. I'll be happy to pray with you and introduce you to this beautiful Jesus. This Jesus is not the one that's out to condemn you. This Jesus is the one that will teach you how to go and sit no more. Thank you, Jesus. Ever give your life to Jesus? Meet me out here so we can pray together. I want to make a second altar call. This second altar call is for those that are in the room that the Jesus that they've met, the one that they know sounds nothing like the one who I just was talking about. The Jesus that you met, the God that you met is the angry one in the sky with the big white beard that's at any wrong move, he's going to smite you. You know that Jesus. You know that God. But you want to be introduced to a new Jesus. I want to introduce you to him. I want our team to pray with you. If Thelma and David could come up and stand here. If, if you want prayer, come on up. We want to pray with you. We want to introduce you to this new Jesus. We want to introduce you to this new Jesus. Come on up. Yeah. Jesus is looking at you with open arms and saying, neither do I condemn you. I'm not saying there's no consequences for sin. I'm saying Jesus is looking you in the eye and saying, I want to take away your consciousness of this thing. Thank you, Jesus. You want us to agree with you? We've got one prayer partner standing by. We want to release the goodness of God to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
You don't have to be afraid of punishment. Be afraid. If you need prayer for anything else, if you have sickness in your body, we want to pray that God heals you. You've got issues that you want us to just agree with you in prayer. Come on up. We're happy to pray with you. We're calling Encounters Church because we believe that everyone will, that walks in will receive an encounter with the Lord. We're actively intentional about connecting your hearts with heaven so that you can receive an encounter with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, worship you, adore you. wants to release you from the hold of religion. He wants to release your mind from the hold of religion. The spirit of religion that causes you to always think that you're under condemnation. The spirit of religion is what causes you to think anytime th something goes wrong, oh, what am I doing wrong? The spirit of religion tells you that you are the problem and not there is a problem. The spirit of religion just constantly keeps going after you, causing you to think that you're less than who you are. You were made in his image and his likeness. By eating of the fruit, the fruit of religion, you gain the knowledge of good and evil, but you already have it. You can't gain it already. The serpent tricked Adam and Eve into getting something they already had. You already are the righteousness of God in Christ. You already are his fullness. You already are the one that God loves. And so the challenges in your life, if your heart is in him, it's not because the, God is doing something to you. God doesn't tempt any man. Remember about a year ago when we were doing our first pray and share, meeting with a guy out in the streets, and he was like, God hates me. God will do this to me. God, the reason why I'm homeless, this is because God hates me. And he was just going on and on about what God does to him. And he talked about he hadn't seen his son for so long. And I looked him in the eye and says, If would you do what you're doing? If you say God's doing this, would you do this to your own son? And he said, nope, I would never do that to my son. If you won't do that to your son, how much more God to you? God's getting credit for things he didn't do. God needs to get a lot more credit for being loving, caring. The one who is hard is. I still feel like I want to leave the altar open. If, if you just want to come kneel and, and pray, that's fine. We could, we'll, I'll get a prayer partner to come and find you. I've got people who come and pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We've got one more prayer partner available. Kayla's up here praying. Come on up. Oh. Uh, just one person you're kind of sitting on the fence you're not quite sure of your salvation experience you're kind of sitting on the fence 
you feel that you came to him, but you're just not sure. If that's you, you know, just come on up. I want to bless you. I want to release the grace of God to you. Thank you, Jesus. God is for you. He's not against you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, we adore you. We'll take about a minute or two and then we'll kind of change the order of our service. If you need prayer, feel free to come up. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. God has taken away the need for punishment. Yes, sir. Take it as well, man. God's doing something in the room. I want you to continue to connect your hearts with him as he's doing something. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Yes, James. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness today. We thank you for what you're doing. Thank you that we get to celebrate this day, celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We are so thankful and we're grateful for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.
and David. God bless you. You're still praying. You're sitting, you're sitting. God's doing something in your seat. Feel free to stick around. If you need to go get your kids from the class, that's fine. If you got to leave, totally get it. God bless you. Happy Resurrection Day. Good times. Mm -hmm.